Yeah, it's five o'clock. Hello and welcome to the webinar Synthetic Network in Azure Stack HCI. My name is Carsten Rachfall, but not I'm presenting today. Um, it is Dan Kuomo. I hope the name, the last name is correct, Dan. <laughs> if not, you can, <laughs> you can close enough. Dan is uh, a senior program manager in the Microsoft networking team and um, he will talk today about networking in Hyper-V and Azure Stack HCI. And I'm very happy that Dan has the time to join us because now in Redmond we have 8 o'clock in the morning, right? It's 8 a.m. Yes. <laughs> so he, he came in early just to give this webinar. Thanks for that. So Dan asked me to do a poll. So I try that. I, I don't usually do polls in the webinar. So now you should see a question and does your Hyper-V virtual <coughs> switch use SET, so switch embedded teaming or LBFO team? Please answer the questions. Oh, I see. Then do you see the answers? Uh, uh, I don't see the answers, no, I see the. So in the moment we are at 70% SET, that will make you very happy, I think. Yes. Oh, and yes. 20, <laughs> no, now it's shifting a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't want to see the question here, so it's a... <laughs> so the question is, does your Hyper-V virtual switch use SET or LBFO teaming? And while you, while you are voting, uh, please, if you have questions during the presentation of Dan, please ask them in English or if you are a German, uh, German speaker, you can also ask them in German and I will translate them for you. But it's important that you ask your questions because we have not often um, really uh, someone from the product group here who can really answer this stuff very well. So I will stop the poll now. We have 73% of the people voted. Um, okay, and it is 63% use the SET switch for their Hyper-V uh, switch and 37, 39, now oh, it's switching a bit, 39, <laughs> use the LBFO switch. Now the people who use LBFO are voting. So it's, <laughs> it's around 60 to, uh, to uh, 40%. Okay, so I close the vote and we will switch the presentation to Dan. Okay, uh, Dan, the, the stage is yours. Please, please start. Uh, okay, well, hello everybody. Sorry for that. Uh... Slight uh, technical challenge there. It's my uh, first time with you on this presentation, so uh, on this we webinar. So, you know, again, thank you for having me. I'm a senior program manager on the Windows Core networking team at Microsoft. Uh, so, I own the network data plane, right? And so, the network data plane really defines any any path in which the the data goes to get into your machine, up to your application. You know, whether that be through the you know, the Hyper-V virtual switch, you know, an Azure Stack and Azure Stack HCI. Or you know, just in, even into your native host, maybe you're using RDMA, maybe you're not. You know, so I own each one of those little data paths in the data plane, right? And so today we're going to talk about one of those uh, data paths called the synthetic data path. Um, now, you know, Carson uh, had the poll up there, and I'm really glad to hear that you know the majority of folks were actually using uh, switch embedded teaming or SET. Um, today I'm going to give you a few more reasons why you might want to consider using SET. Um, all of the synthetic accelerations that we use on Windows Server 2016 and 2019 were built with SET in mind. Um, most of them, all, all the new ones, uh, work with SET, and we have a you know, differing level of support with LBFO. And so we'll get into that a little bit, um, but that's really why we wanted to uh, have this conversation and see, um, you know, or the poll there and just see where everybody's at. So. You know, this is going to be our, our agenda here. So we, we've already done the poll. Um, it sounds like, uh, what, what was it, Carson, 62, I think around 62% of the population is using uh, switch embedded teaming, uh, which is great. We'd love to even incentivize or encourage some of those other folks that are using LBFO to, to switch over. So what we're really going to do here, uh, we're going to go into an overview on LBFO, what that is. Then I'm going to you know, kind of walk you through an art gallery and show you, you know, what exactly, uh, how LBFO works and some of the pluses and minuses of it, right? And then we're going to talk about set. We're going to uh, switch over and talk about set. 
And then finally, we're going to talk about synthetic accelerations, right, in set. And I'm going to walk through how, for example, VMQ and VMMQ and VRSS and v uh, dynamic VMMQ, and all, all these little, you know, acronyms work in uh, the operating system. And then I hope through this you'll start to see uh, where set actually comes in in, in, uh, in a positive light there. So, all right, so let's jump into our LBFO overview here. Uh, so LBFO, you know, first came into Windows Server on Server 2012 and higher, right? So this is an endless level teaming solution, which means it happens, um, let me see if I can get my laser pointer here. It starts here inside the host, right? So it, it'll team these NICs, right? And there's a, it's a software level teaming that's available on every system, right? As far as 2012 and higher. And, you know, it builds this kind of hierarchy until it gets, you know, and then you can attach it to the V switch. Up here, you'd have like your host VNICs. Um, here would be a virtual machine, right? And this is going into a VM NIC, right? Same thing here. But you can see all of these attach off of the V switch and then they build off of the LBFO team, right? Um, this is, uh, you know, what we shipped in 2012 and 2012 R2 and later. So at the time, switch embedded teaming was not available, right? Switch embedded teaming took us a little longer to uh, kind of develop. And, uh, and so as a result, it wasn't available at that time. Um, so when would you use LBFO? Well, you would use LBFO on native hosts, first and foremost, because switch embedded teaming is not available on native hosts, right? Switch embedded teaming is embedded in the Hyper-V switch today. And so it ultimately cannot be brought to native. Um, and so the other time when I would encourage you to still use LBFO is on 2012 and 2012 R2, right? Now the synthetic accelerations that we're gonna talk about today don't apply to native hosts, right? Native hosts do not require VMQ uh, or VRSS or any of these other uh, exotic accelerations, right? Instead, they rely on the native accelerations, which is in general just RSS, right? Receive side scaling. Um, so if you're on a native host, I would highly encourage you use uh, LBFO, obviously. Um, you know, that's really the only option you have for teaming. Um, and if you're on this operating system, 2012 and 2012 R2. Now, you might be asking yourself, why shouldn't I be using uh, LBFO on Hyper-V? And, uh, you know, in a very vain way, I'm going to quote myself here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, LBFO is our older teaming technology. It won't see future investment, right? We're just not actively investing in, in LBFO. Uh, and it's not compatible with several advanced capabilities. Many of them we'll talk about today. Um, and it's been exceeded in both performance stability um, in, in all areas as far as we're concerned, right? As far as we have seen based on our telemetry, on our support cases, um, which covers kind of all across the world, right? So uh, we have some pretty good data on that. And so that's, that's partly why I'm here today to kind of encourage you to, to use SET is that we're seeing customers have better experiences with switch embedded teaming, okay? So then I have, right, a, I have the I have the first question. If I sure. just can interrupt you, um, Brian is asking, can you use SET in a non S2D cluster environment? Yes, you can. Um, as long as Hyper-V is installed on Windows Server 2016 or 2019, you can use switch embedded teaming. Thanks, Dan. Uh, just one, also one thing to add to that: um, a lot of folks I've heard are they will make a uh, you know, like their management team, for example, might be on LBFO, but their Hyper-V switch is attached to switch embedded teaming. Um, you know, there's some, certainly some discussion I'd love to have with some folks on this one. Um, I don't necessarily see a reason for using both. Um, I, you know, again, like I said, we're, we're not actively investing in LBFO. And so ultimately SET is going to get all the latest and greatest uh, fixes. And so I would highly encourage, even on that, if once you have Hyper-V installed, use set as your teaming solution, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna kind of walk through uh, an art gallery, so to speak, right? You're gonna, we're gonna have uh, kind of some picture frames here and you'll see some of the uh, things that LBFO does or does not do, right? All right, so this is LBFO and quote unquote missing solu solutions, right? And I hope you guys can see the, the color transition there. It's it's moving to black and white, right? So here's some things that LBFO does not do, right? 
So storage space is direct. Storage space is direct, like we were just talking about. You could use with LBFO, but you cannot use uh, storage space as direct in its recommended pattern. I, and by that, I mean you cannot use storage space as direct with uh, RDMA, right? So remote direct memory access, which is the recommended networking uh, pattern for storage space as direct, you can't do with LBFO. You cannot team RDMA adapters with LBFO. You cannot use the Microsoft SDN stack. So if you're doing software-defined networking, where you have network controller and overlay networks, um, BGP and that type of stuff, you can't use uh, LBFO. LBFO does not support the uh, vSwitch extensions needed to, to run the SDN uh, stack. You can't use guest teaming. I mean, you can, right? You can, but it's not gonna actually team the guests. Uh, so, LBFO does not support VNIC uh, team affinity, right? So if I had a VNIC, I cannot map that VNIC to a PNIC on the team, to a physical NIC on the team, right? And because of that, it's very possible that both VNICs actually land on the same physical NIC. And so from that perspective, if that one physical NIC goes out, I've now lost my team, right? I've lost my redundancy in the guests. So guest teaming doesn't really work um, with LBFO. You cannot do hardware offloaded 20 gigabits per second. I'll talk about what that means um, in a little bit, but effectively uh, you cannot get past 20 gigabits, which could be two by 10 gigabit adapters on LBFO um, with, with hardware support. And of course there's even more coming at Ignite, right? So we're, if you're gonna be at Ignite, please stop by our booth. We'll be happy to chat about this. Um, but we'll also be uh, talking about a few new capabilities that we're building native support into, uh, sorry, wrong terminology there. We're building support into uh, or for certain tools with switch embedded teaming in mind, but we won't be building in LBFO solutions uh, into Windows Admin Center or any of the other capabilities that we're gonna be uh, bringing at Ignite. Ben, can I just interrupt and ask two questions? Sure. So one question from Günther uh, is uh, work set only with RDMA network cards. So does uh, set only work with RDMA capable network cards? No, it does not. Uh, switch embedded teaming will work with any uh, adapter that you have in your server. Um, what we do require is that because it is a software level teaming solution, um, we require that the adapters are symmetric and I think we talk about this in a little bit actually uh, on the set slide. So I'll, I'll wait to actually discuss what symmetric really means, but we'll, we'll chat about that in a second. Okay, we, uh, then I will ask the other question later. Thank you. Okay, all right. So um, next up, so this is LBFO with missing solutions, right? So obviously there's some key scenarios that aren't working here uh, or that don't work with LBFO. Now here's some of the feature lists and actually I've, I've slimmed this down a little bit. <laughs> um, to kind of make the slide work here. But really, these are the things that LBFO does not support. So we have virtual machine multi-queue. You'll note VMQ is not on this list, right? It does work with VMQ. Um, but LBFO does not work with virtual machine multi-queue, where, and what, again, we'll go through this in a little bit. It does not work with dynamic VMMQ, where I can assign multiple virtual machine queues and then even move them around if the system is overloaded or, or uh, CPUs are pegged. It doesn't work with RSC. Um, LBFO and SET, neither of them work with the RSC offload, uh, but switch embedded teaming has a has a very granular, uh, we've actually seen better performance with the software version called RSC and the vSwitch. Um, and we're, gonna, we're going to continue to add improvements to this feature, but that's also not supported in LBFO. Um, you cannot team remote direct memory access adapters like we already mentioned. You cannot do guest RDMA. You can't use any of the SDN features uh, with LBFO. For example, SDN QAS, right? Which is really our modern QAS capability, right? All of our uh, enhanced QAS capabilities and, and um, uh, finely grained control of QAS is in the SDN stack and you can't use the SDN stack as we mentioned. So no distributed firewall with ACLs, no SDN QAS. There's a, a, a number of things that you can't do uh, in the SDN stack you know, with LBFO. Uh, IEEE 802.1X, right? So this port channeling, uh, uh, port security, excuse me, um, will not work uh, with LBFO. Virtual NIC pinning, 
right? We already mentioned with guest guest pinning, uh, sorry, excuse me, guest teaming. Um, you can't pin that those VNICs to specific PNICs. And so, you know, the team mapping here does not work. SRIOV on host virtual NIC. So actually getting a, a physical function into the, the virtual NIC uh, on the physical host does not work, right? So again, RDMA, uh, effectively, this is where you would use potentially RDMA. But even if you didn't have an RDMA capable adapter, you could use what's called SRIOV, um, which is a very common technology that will work on LBFO to a virtual machine, but not on host Phoenix. Okay. All right. So this is uh, one of the key reasons why I hear people want to use LBFO is that, look, you know, my customer wants to uh, use LACP or my, my network team requires me to use LACP. Here's what I want to actually uh, call out, right, with LACP. Most people expect this experience, right? They have a switch and they have two uh, co connections coming down to their, in this case, I'll use 25 gigabit adapters, right? And that looks like one big transmit and receive pipe. That's what, that's what everybody expects, right? Is I'm going to get 50 gigabits into this host. And then they expect that they're going to get, you know, up to 50 gigabits in any one of these other pipes, right? They ex they believe that that pipe is going to extend to the virtual NICs, right? And then ultimately, they want to make sure that they have efficient, even distribution and low utilization like any other scenario, right? Like, why wouldn't you, right? <laughs> of course you do, right? You want your CPUs to be evenly used. Um, you don't want pegs. Uh, you know, on certain CPUs, and you want to have, you don't want to use a lot of that CPU because you want to save that for running virtual machines, right? Um, and so that's what people expect, but here's what they actually see, right? They'll see the switch, they'll see the port channel coming down to the two physical NICs in the host. They'll get that one big pipe into the host, but then here, when you go to the virtual machines, you don't get one big pipe. All you're actually getting is one virtual machine queue for each virtual NIC. Remember, LBFO does not support uh, some of the advanced synthetic accelerations like VMMQ, virtual machine multi-queue. It only supports one VMQ. And so you actually end up relying, to get, to get past your one CPU core, you actually rely on VRSS, which is a software spreading capability, right, to actually move packets onto other CPUs and get past five gigabits. So you'll get to maybe 15 or 20 gigabits maximum when you're using LBFO per VNIC, right? Um, and you're going to greatly use almost all of your cores, right? I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna do all of this in software, so it's gonna cost you a lot, right? But max in a, on a single VNIC is probably gonna be around 20, 20 gigabits. So in summary here, right, you know, LACP really does not provide any throughput benefits for virtual environments, none, right? And I just, I hope that resonates, right? It, it does not provide any benefits for virtualization environments. In fact, it actually causes higher CPU consumption because we're unable to offload onto more VMQs. Um, and ultimately, again, we don't support things like dynamic VMMQ, right? Dynamic VMMQ doesn't work. And so we have static assignment of these cores. The real problem there is, let's say that we have a, a whole bunch of VMs that all land on the same core, well, I can't remove, I can't move them onto av other available CPUs. And so again, static core assignment doesn't work. These workloads will compete. And so you get, your CPUs will look very hot, right? So, you know, you're not going to get any advanced throughput here. You're going to get very hot CPU workload here. Um, this is what actually LACP looks like in Hyper-V, right? Were there any questions on that? No, our audience is very shy. I uh, wow. just have That's to encourage you. If you want to ask in German, I will translate it. So Dan said, uh, L, uh, LACP has no advantage at all in an Hyper-V environment. And um, he quoted me. Some... <laughs> yeah, almost <laughs> everybody has questions about that. So I'm, I'm very sh surprised. <laughs> Please do <laughs> join in. I'm, I'm, I'm too, because usually my audience is very, uh, have, has a lot of questions. So here's one from Jan. Is there any concern when you have MLUG in use uh, and with a set switch, packet handling? Sorry, could you, what was the, could you say that again? Yeah, is there any concern when you have 
Uh, MLUG in use with a, a set V switch. Uh, Packing. I'm packing not sure. handling yeah. MLUC is is a possibility uh, for Cisco, for example, or um, Mellanox. You 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 um, you have the possibility to do LACP on different switches. So for that, you need a, a communication between the switches. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so I think okay. So let me just make sure I understand the question. So the question is. Uh, is there any concern when I do LACP across different switches? Is that? Mm, I, I don't know. Jan, can you okay. maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more so or clarify your question? So in the moment, I have another question. It's not really on topic where you, what you are handling here, but uh, Jan, another Jan is asking, SMB is separate in two networks. So Jan, this is just a, um, a remark or a question. We don't need any teaming for RMA. Um, so yeah, so let me yeah have. let me extrapolate that a little bit, right? So for SMB, right, um, you can do it in either a single network or dual networks. We recommend that you separate the networks, right? Um, what what ends up happening? See, SMB is very good at what it does, right? SMB uses RSS and actually spreads across the available VNICs, right? And so any available VNIC, it will just use indiscriminately, right? So if you have SMB01 and SMB02, and they have access to the same uh, to the same networks, then SMB01 will actually send to both, the, to the receivers SMB01 and SMB02 simultaneously, right? That's not really a great scenario, right? We really we want one VNIC talking to one VNIC on the other side. And so that's why we recommend that you separate the the traffic. Yeah. Um, and the, you're correct. The question. Go ahead. Sorry, Dan. Uh, I, I just let me add a bit uh, because there was uh, the best practice from Microsoft around uh, uh, 2019 when SMB and clustering uh, was capable of being in one subnet that you should use one subnet. Uh, but now, uh, to clarify, Microsoft uh, uh, recommends to use multiple subnets if you have multiple NICs, correct? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I can expand on that too. I mean, the bottom line here, guys, is that, um, you know, and when we, if we back up all the way to 2012 and 2012 R2, right, shared storage bases was a thing. Um, and at the time, they had a requirement for separate networks, right? And so in server 2016, we overcame that capability, right? And much, much to do with, uh, Customer feedback, just you know, from yourselves, I'm sure uh, many of you provided that feedback and said, I, you know, I don't have dual subnets to actually provide. And so he said, Well, look, we now we can do this on one single subnet, right? Hmm. Um, and then again, now we're learning, right? As we've learned and we've seen, you know, storage spaces direct has hit an inflection point. I mean, it's it's being everybody's deploying it, right? If you're not deploying it, then you should be, right? <laughs> um, you know, storage spaces direct has hit such an inflection point and we've learned so much and seen so many different networks now that, um, you know, again, while it will work with one subnet and you could very well be fine, we find that separating the networks works best. Mm. Um, you just won't run into the congestion control problems that you might otherwise see with, for example, Rocky based RDMA. Um, and there's just, just a number of different scenarios where controlling the traffic traffic as explicitly as possible work a little bit better. Um, that's not always true. You'll see that, uh, you know, one of my recommendations later for synthetic accelerations is not to necessarily do uh, more configuration. Um, but on the physical fabric here, I think, you know, it, it can make sense. Again, test. Um, you know, my recommendation is not going to be 100% applicable to your environment. I'm going to tell you what the best of what I've seen in our STDC testing, right? So all the testing we do for Windows Server and Azure Stack HCI, I'll tell you what we see works best. Mm -hmm. um, but that might or might not necessarily apply broad scale for uh, you know every single environment. You might be fine with a single subnet, you might not, so. So I have more, we asked for questions, so now we get questions. Okay. I have three or four more questions, so do Great. you like to handle them now or? Sure. Or at the end of uh, so, uh, Jan clarified his question. He said uh, yes. When MLUC is in use, can the set V switch handle the packet flow over multiple switches? So they mean I think Jan means physical switches. 
So the question again, yes, yes, when MLAC is in use, can the set V switch handle the packet flow over multiple physical switches? So yeah, so the 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 summary of the answer there is yes. Um, I don't I don't know MLOC offhand, right? So I I will simply say that if and when um, if and when there is uh, if and when you have uh, two physical NICs going to separate uh, physical switches, set is okay with that. Set will be fine, and you can receive you can always receive on both, right? LACP doesn't say that you can doesn't mean that you can only receive on both if you're LACP'd, right? It simply means that per flow, you might only receive on one. So so for example, one VM, one VM VNIC might receive or get the maximum of one physical NIC, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas okay. you might have multiple other VNICs and you'll then get the actual throughput you're looking for across it. So you can still, cons like you'll c still consume 25 gigabits on both of these adapters, right? without LACP and switch embedded teaming. So the next question, I will go a little bit faster through them. Um, uh, Frank asked, would it be a problem to create a vSwitch for every NIC and then use LBFO in the VM? <laughs> That's, uh, hmm. it's not a problem. Um, I. I would like to understand the scenario a little bit better. Um, offhand, I would say, no, it's probably not a problem. But I would, that's kind of a, almost a, what I would call an exotic configuration, and I'd like to understand more about what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. I, I would say, way, Frank, there this may is, be a better way. Yeah, there may be a better way. So maybe you sent me a mail, Frank, and uh, elaborated about what you want to do, and I send it to Dan. Yep. So, uh, so can I have a set switch for one gigabit uh, built in NIX on a server and another set for 10 gigabit QLogic NIX? Yes, you absolutely can do that. We'll talk about the requirements uh, in a little bit. Um, I think that's coming up. Yeah, that should be coming up in the next slide um, or two. But yeah, that the only thing I want to really hammer home there, and I'll, I'll do this on the next slide, is the symmetric requirement for set. Okay. So. When you use a single subnet for SMB direct traffic in, S uh, in an S2D HCI cluster, we use, thanks for the heads up on single versus dual SMB networks. Yep. Uh, now has a lot of, yeah, Matt, uh, it's really important. So so I was ignoring the best practice from, uh, from Redmond to use one SMB network. <laughs> and I'm happy that Dan is now, uh, Dan is now saying, yeah, we we have learned also that two that multiple SMB uh, subnets would be have some benefits. Let it put that way. Yes. Uh, so I think we are done with the questions so far. Right. I'm very happy that you ask questions. So please then go on with your presentation. Okay. <laughs> and All we right. will have more questions at the, the next chapter. Right. So now we're going to get on to really the 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 core of the presentation, right? Where we're going to spend the majority of our time. Um, this is this is a often misunderstood area, right? We'll talk about set first, and then we'll go into the actual synthetic accelerations. And so I'm gonna spend some time here. We're gonna go a little slow. I suspect there will be a ton of questions here. So please do let me know. Um, don't be bashful. So this is switch embedded teaming, right? And what happens with switch embedded teaming is, you'll notice we don't have any of the uh, component buildup that we had here before, right? Instead, we, we team the NICs at the actual virtual switch. So everything is contained within the vSwitch here, right? Okay, this switch embedded teaming came um, uh, in server 2016 and higher. It's also available on Windows 10 workstation SKUs, right? So if you want to, if you have RDMA capable NICs in your workstation SKUs and you want to team those RDMA NICs um, and then you know talk to something in the backend data center, you can do that, right? Um, on Windows 10, on your Windows 10 client. So in summary, really what we're trying to do here um, is, is emphasize that this is, our, this is our preferred teaming solution. In all cases in which you can use switch embedded teaming, we do recommend that you use switch embedded teaming. Um, if you, of course, if you don't have a hypervisor installed, you're, you, you only have LBFO available, right? But then you should uh, potentially con uh, you know, assess the, the value of just adding the hypervisor and using switch embedded teaming. 
Um, ultimately, if you're using Hyper-V and Azure Stack HCI scenarios, you should be using switch embedded teaming. You 100% should be. If you're using storage spaces direct, you almost certainly have uh, Hyper-V installed. Okay. If you're using SDN, you definitely have Hyper-V installed. If you're using Hyper-V, obviously you have Hyper-V installed, right? In all of these cases, we'd recommend using switch embedded teaming. Yeah. Um, then, then can I yes. add some some one point that is maybe important, and a lot of people don't know that. So, if you have an Azure Stack HCI certified vendor solution, or with 2016 a, a WSSD certified solution, the tests that are run on these solutions to certify them, they all include a set switch, so in switch embedded teaming. Excellent. So if you yes. if you want the the same tested um, solution. Uh, it's only tested with a set switch. Um, the private cloud simulator uh, is relying on a set switch, so this is a tested solution for Microsoft. Yeah, that's that's a great point, actually, um, because at the end of the day, when you buy a, a solution from the vendor, they're saying, hey, this is WSSD premium or what have you, right? Azure Stack HCI premium certified. Well, that premium, it, it's certified with switch embedded teaming, right? Um, now we'll actually talk about how that relates to the hardware, right? Because you say, well, this is a hardware solution um, that I'm buying from the vendor that's getting certified. How does that relate to a software-based team? I'll show you that in a second, right? Are we, uh, is, were there any other questions before I move on? Nope. No, we are, we are good now. All right, so before, we, I'm just gonna level set here, right? We're gonna talk about what a NIC offload is because when we talk about VMQ and all of these other other things, you know, VMMQ, et cetera, these are NIC offloads, right? So with a NIC offload, the operating system provides uh, OS level pl or platform level support for a feature, right? It may have been able to do that same operation in software at the expense of host CPU, right? So I can do it, it'll cost me a little bit more in terms of host CPU but I could do the capability, right? Instead, we're trying to get out of that CPU consumption so that you can run more VMs, right? And so in order to do that, we might choose to offload certain capabilities to the NIC, right? The NIC itself will actually be able to perform some operations on our behalf. This is uh, somewhat of a complicated, you know, a tangled web of communication between the operating system, the mini port driver, the mini port driver, and the physical NIC, right? And so there's, you know, there is some conversation that happens between the OS and cooperation that happens between the OS and the NIC vendors, right? And so what I really want to emphasize here is that, uh, you know, just like Carson, Carson just said, you know, we're testing with set, uh, uh, with the, you know, or sorry, we're validating with set in these certified examples. Um, that's validating both the hardware and the software, right? And those interactions. So. This is what we define as the synthetic data path. I'll take you through this, right, so that it's, it looks kind of like an R chart, right? But effectively, traffic comes in and goes up through these physical ports, right? The NIC uh, interrupts the host, right? So this is happening here in the host. This is what the parent partition is, right? So if you're familiar with Hyper-V architecture, we have a parent partition, which is the host OS. Um, the NIC will interrupt that host OS, and that causes CPU consumption right? It'll pass the traffic up to the virtual switch. There's more CPU consumption. It'll pass the traffic down to this VM bus, and traffic will ride along this VM bus. Again, more CPU cycles are being burned. It'll pass it up to the NetVSC adapter, which is, uh, you know, internally we call this the NetVSC adapter, but this is the VNIC, right? The host VNIC. Um, there's more CPU consumption here. Everywhere across this path, from the physical NIC like once it leaves the physical NIC, gets the OS, these are all CPU consuming, right? Okay, so this is the synthetic data path. And it really emphasizes, I think, why we try to offload as much as we can from the synthetic data path, okay? Ultimately, this traffic, um, you know, it's not just the CPU, but it's also latency, right? So it might take, you know, if you're using RDMA, you'll have much better latency um, doing guest RDMA into a VM than you would on the synthetic data path. Unfortunately, RDMA doesn't work for every data path, right? And so you have to kind of pick and choose. But long story short, a lot of CPU is burned here. Um, but this is the data path that we're talking about, right? Traffic comes in the NIC, up to the host, across the VM bus, into the VNIC, okay? 
So now let's zoom in to you know, this physical neck, what this looked like. Now in 2012 R2, right, 2012 R2 and below, right, we had what's called legacy VMQ. And we're calling it legacy VMQ because we have a modern VMQ that we'll talk about um, once we get to 2016 and whatnot, right? This is a receive side offload, right? So this VMQ only comes into play when you're dealing with receive traffic, okay? It's not about send traffic, right? It's only about receive traffic. Um, the OS tells VMQ how it operates, right? So some of you, are, I'm sure you're well familiar in the old days you did set net adapter VMQ and you set your, uh, the processors that the adapter could use and all these things. That's the OS, you're telling the OS, hey, go tell the NIC what to do here, right? And so there's a number of those things that you can configure in the NIC, right? Um, in 2012 R2, we did not use RSS with VMQ, right? They were mutually exclu exclusive, right? Um, they were mutually exclusive because they didn't have uh, a capability we'll talk about in a little bit. They instead had this thing called a, a MAC and VLAN filter. So what happens is when traffic comes in through this NIC, it gets hashed. And it falls into a, I'll call it a bucket for a last, uh, lack of a better word. But these, these different flows of traffic destined for certain virtual NICs up here, right? These different flows get hashed and they get hashed differently, right? They look like different hashes to the NIC. And so the NIC will try to assign a VMQ, right? And if it's assigned a VMQ, each VMQ can interrupt a different processor, right? Its own processor. It doesn't have to interrupt processor zero. It can interrupt one to n number of, you know, they, wh whichever processor you have available in the, in the system, right? For any VM or any virtual uh, traffic that does not get a VMQ, right? It falls into this default queue, right? And in 2012 and 2012 R2, that wasn't too bad, right? Because we had 10 gigabit NICs. And so realistically, you know, anybody that didn't get a VMQ is gonna fall into this default queue. They're all gonna share one VMQ, right? That's a problem today, right? We'll talk about how we overcome that today in a little bit. But that's a, that's, that wasn't a problem for the time it is now, right? Because ultimately one VMQ can only process about five gigabits worth of data, right? Give or take. Um, you know, your mileage may vary on that, right? But generally speaking, you're only gonna get about five gigabits of data through a single VMQ, okay? And that's if you have the full CPU core available to you, right? Um, this was, VMQ in general was available on, uh, what was only going to be enabled if you had 10 gigabit NICs or higher. So you might say, well, it's not spreading. I have my one gigabit NICs in there. That's, we don't enable VMQ by default on one gigabit NICs, okay? Um, any questions on that? Was the Mac and VLAN filter clear, right? It basically, it takes a Mac and the VLAN from the VNIC, it hashes those together into its own bucket, and then tries to assign a VMQ to it. It might not. It might not be able to assign a VMQ. Maybe, you know, maybe you're, you've told it not to, right, in the, VM, in the VNIC properties, or maybe you've run out, um, et cetera. So, all right, so that's legacy VMQ with 2012 R2 and below, right? So this is what it actually looks like in action. In action, I'll, I'll take you through this a little bit more because um, you know some of these lines are a little complicated here, right? But again, traffic comes through here, right? Um, the uh, before we get there, actually, the OS. You can see the OS creates what we call an indirection table, right? Very simple, si uh, similar to the way RSS works, right? And we pass that down through the mini port to the physical NIC, right? And um, we set up a number. We we you know, obviously configure VMQ the way we've, you've been told from the OS, right? The processor arrays, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately uh, the NIC receives these instructions and maps the VMQs. Each individual VMQ, you can see like VMQ zero will actually map CPU to CPU two in this case, or uh, CPU, uh, sorry, VMQ N here maps to CPU three. And then that CPU would then pass that traffic up to, it would process the traffic and send it up to the virtual NIC. Okay. In the what's not shown here is actually once it leaves the VMQ, it's you know the the V switch actually receives it and it has to be you know processed by these CPUs. It's it's not really important for this uh, this section. The synthetic data path is still applies here, right? Okay, moving on. So now legacy VMQ and VRSS. So 
many of you probably came to me. I'm sure it was Karsten that brought this up to begin with, right? Karsten said, Dan, five gigabits, one CPU core, really? That's all I get? Um, it, it's not good enough, right? It's not good enough. I want to exceed what I can do to a single VNIC, right? Um, and so we brought in, in 2012 or two, we added this capability called virtual receive side scaling. Now the portion of VRSS that most people are aware of is inside the VM, right? If you have multiple vCPUs in the VM, we can, we'll make that traffic uh, even, right? We'll distribute that traffic evenly among the CPUs in the, in the virtual machine. <clears throat> excuse me excuse me um and that that's the intent there is that you could be bottlenecked on one single vcpu right and so again we spread that traffic out right um but on the host we create an indirection table of this is very much like rss this is exactly rss right that's why we call it vrss and again we pass that down through the mini port down to the nic right um VMQ still only interrupts one processor, right? So when packets come in mapped for VMQ4, right, or we'll map those packets for VMQ4, it'll be processed by CPU4. And then in software, VRSS on the host can spread that traffic, right? So let's say that we have high throughput, right? This VNIC wants 12 gigabits of data. Well, a single VMQ can't do that. It can only uh, meet five gigabits. And so VMQ4 will send that up to the host, and then the virtual switch, VRSS, will actually spread traffic. It'll hand out packets to these other CPUs to be processed, right? And it'll do that as many as it can, right, up to about 8 or 16 at a max, right? But again, this is expensive in terms of CPU cost, right, because here's the offload. The offload is, sent everything, is sending everything up to this, what we call the base VMQ, or the base processor. And then it passes all of that traffic, hands out those packets, and that's all done in software, right? That's all CPU cycles, right? And then from those CPUs, eventually that traffic goes up to the VNIC, right? And we get even distribution in the ho in the guest, right? So now, you know, now instead of being stuck on five gigabits, for example, maybe you can get to 15 or or 20. At the time, it was probably around 15 given the hardware and whatnot we had available, right? So 15 to 20 gigabits, okay? So this is VRSS, and this is true even in, in modern capabilities, right? This is, uh, VRSS can work like this. I'll show this again when we get to the VMMQ and how it relates, all right? Now there's one more capability in 2012 or two uh, that we had, which was called dynamic VMQ, right? And so I'm sure the question will come later, you know, or many of you probably have already started thinking, he keeps mentioning dynamic VMMQ, or he's mentioned that. Um, I've heard that on some of the blogs that I've been reading and things like that, dynamic VMMQ. We had, v we had dynamic VMQ before. What's so special about dynamic VMMQ? Well, this was a feature that was completely rewritten, right? So legacy dynamic VMQ only actually existed in 2012 or two. It was not available in 2012. And then, <clears throat> because of the architecture changes that we'll talk about in a, in a second, it didn't exist on 2016 either, right? We actually had better ways to exceed, uh, to do the same thing, and then we finally just improved it again in server 2019, right? So with VMMQ. So dynamic VMQ on 2012 or two, you know, lived and died only in that operating system. And effectively what happens here is when packets come in, they can be, they can go into, you know, a single VMQ, like VMQ3, like we said, and they might be on the, they might be assigned to the same CPU as another workload, right? And so, you know, let's say that both of these guys want five gigabits of data, right? Well, they can't both get five gig because a single CPU can only do five gig, right? So what happens is this CPU starts to get pegged, right? It's really hot. And, um, if you've been through some support cases with us, that's one of the things that we look for is, you know, do you get even distribution or how, how does your distribution actually look on the host, right? And so uh, what'll, what'll end up happening is with dynamic VMQ, we can move one of these, over, these overburdened workloads onto another CPU that's uh, available. And now everything kind of goes back, right? We're not, we're not, nothing's pegged here, right? Everybody can keep running and now he's got his five gigabits and he's got his five gigabits, right? 
Now, in reality, uh, this worked very well on medium to low, uh, like low to medium throughput systems. Once you got to high throughput environments, this did not work very well, and that's partially why we changed how we went about uh, doing this this feature in 2016. Uh, sorry, 2019 and beyond. Okay. So that's 2012 R2 and below. That is also extinct, right? So uh, that that is extinct today. We don't that you know that lived and only if you're using 2012 R2 will you have dynamic VMQ. All right. All right. So now let's talk about what's happening today, right? So in server 2016 and server 2019, but around the time of server 2016, right? Nix had this capability to have an embedded layer two switch called a Nix switch, right? And what that allows us to do is we can remove that Mac and VLAN filter that we had before. And instead we create what's called, you know, like a virtual port. You can think of this just like a, an actual physical switch has ports. This is a, you know, a virtual switch that lives in the NIC, right? This is not an offload for the host OS V switch, but it's another switch effectively that lives inside the NIC, okay? There's no more Mac and VLAN filtering, right? You just get a port on the switch. Hype, the Hyper-V V switch will actually, uh, will ask the NIC switch to map a V, a v port for each V NIC, okay? And then you could assign with, uh, it, you know, again, take the legacy VMQ scenario, you could assign a queue to each one of these V ports, right? <clears throat> And this will work if you're the folks that answered, hey, I'm using LBFO, this is what happens um, minus the NIC switch, actually, you'll get the Mac and VLAN filtering. Um, but effectively, you'll you'll still have uh, one VMQ with LBFO, right? If you have set on server 2016, this will be your architecture, right? Now, um, if, if some of you, I, I know there's probably some very savvy networking folks out there. Some of you had said, well, what's so special about the NIC switch? We've had that for a long time. We've had NIC switch in terms of SRIOV. So if and when, even before server 2016, if you had an IOV enabled virtual switch, right? If you had IOV enabled um, and passing into your, your virtual NICs, you would create the NIC switch, right? So NIC switches were before server 2016 only tied to SRIOV adapters, right? But if you, you know, if you went to a synthetic ad uh, adapter, right, if you had a synthetic path, you would not be using the NIC switch, right? In server 2016, we decoupled the NIC switch from uh, SRIOV, and we basically, because there were benefits, you know, that we'll talk about in a second, we just create the NIC switch all the time now. The NIC will, we instruct the, the NIC to create the NIC switch all the time, okay? <clears throat> so the summary here is we had an old way of doing, with legacy VMQ, we had a Mac and VLAN filter. Um, and that was, you know, very specific, one VMQ to one filter, right? We could spread that uh, work out with VRSS across multiple CPUs at the expense of host CPU consumption. Um, in 2016, we now use a V port, right? We now use the NIC switch and V ports. All right, so in action, it looks very similar to what we had with legacy VMQ, right? So packets come up here, right? They goes into the NIC, <clears throat> they get assigned a V, a v port, they get assigned a queue, right? That traffic uh, comes up. Oh, you can see my diagram's a little messed up there, but I, it comes up through the VMQ, it interrupts this processor. This processor sends packets out to additional processors if needed, and then all of that traffic gets passed up into the VNIC, right? So functionally the same, right? But this is really the basis of um, the enhanced capabilities we're about to talk talk about with VMMQ, right? This this architecture is only supported with set, right? So LBFO does not uh, do this, right? But effectively, one one also key point I want to bring up here is that RSS is now kind of intertwined with VMQ. Do not disable RSS, right? Um, if you have server 2016 or beyond absolutely do not disable RSS under any circumstances, right? RSS V2, quote unquote, is where we get into, uh, you know, is akin or synonymous with VMMQ, okay? So now let's zoom in on this, this part right here, right? So we mentioned that all of this, this is VRSS handing out packets, right? But we can offload that work, 
right? So let's zoom in here and let's see what actually happens if we offload, offload it. If we take that handing out of traffic and we offload it to the NIC, we get VMMQ. So in the same case, right, VRSS still creates the indirection table. It still passes it down to the NIC and tells the NIC how to operate, right? Which VMQ or which uh, VNICs can have VMQs, which adapters, uh, which processors can the adapters use, et cetera, right? All of that is still passed down through the OS, okay? But you see there's no more spreading of packets done in software up here. The spreading, we actually just assign multiple VMQs per vPort, right? So in this case, the the uh, traffic again, VMQ, uh, sorry, the traffic destined for uh, for uh, VMO2, it has multiple VMQs assigned. So VMQ5 goes up here, VMQ6 six interrupts CPU5, VMQ7 interrupts CPU7, and you know what? This one was a really chatty one, so we actually engaged the default queue a little bit, and we have a fourth VMQ right over here in CPU3. And then all of that traffic, you see there's no horizontal spreading of traffic across CPUs. It just goes straight up now from each one of these CPUs into uh, the, the VNIC, okay? So again, this was an offload of part of VRSS's job. So again, VRSS creates that indirection table. Normally where it would do packet spreading across the processors, it's now offloaded that to the NIC, and the NIC just interrupts multiple different processors for traffic destined to the same destination. That's VMMQ, and that's only available in server 2016 with set. Now we get into the good stuff, right? Dynamic VMMQ. Right? Now dynamic VMMQ, you know, one of the problems that we found or with uh, VMMQ is that it, because it has static assignment, if multiple adapters, mul multiple por uh, VMQ ports are going to the same CPU, they can get overburdened, right? Just like we had uh, in 2012R2 in dynamic VMQ, they can kind of starve one another, right? So in the event where you know VM01 and VM02, their VMQs land on the same processors, you know somebody might suffer, right? Either VMQ VM01 uh, gets all the traffic and nobody else gets any, or VM01 gets some and VM02 gets some and VM03 gets some, but nobody really gets everything that they wanted, right? Um, VMMQ enables us to get more traffic, but then dynamic VMMQ enables us to avoid this conflict between the VMs, right? And so really what it does is um, it, when it, we have low throughput, the system will coalesce uh, traffic onto as few CPUs as possible. And the reason we do this is because, again, we learned that uh, you know, interrupting multiple processors is, ex is expensive, right? Um, even if we're offloading most of it, right? You have to end up interrupting each individual processor in the OS. That's less efficient than just uh, interrupting only the processors we actually need. And so when the system has low throughput, we'll actually coalesce all the traffic. I think I have a demo on this one coming up um, to as few CPUs as possible. When the throughput is high though, we'll expand the traffic dynamically, right? There's nothing you have to do. It will just automatically move the traffic onto additional CPUs. I have a demo for this one as well. And then, um, you know, when the, C when the workload is contended with, um, you know, it will just find another available CPU. And finally, if traffic bursts, right? So if, uh, you know, nothing is happening on the system, we'll have, our queues will be parked. It should not be confused with core parking, right? We're not core parking anything. We're queue parking, which is to say that we uh, pre-allocate VMQs to some of the VNICs, right? And that way, if they get a burst of traffic, they can immediately uh, uh, supply the, the uh, processing needed to actually meet that network demand, right? So dynamic VM VMQ, dynamic VMMQ enables us to do three different things. On low throughput, it'll coalesce for host CPU efficiency. On high throughput, it'll expand onto multiple physical CPUs uh, to make sure that the workload is sustained. And then it'll help us match bursting traffic. Um, and of course, if they're, you know, again, if it's if a single CPU gets overloaded, we'll try to, you know, mix and match and put the Legos together such that, you know, we get the best throughput on the system. All right. So now we're onto our demos. This is uh, a demo on. Let's see if I can get rid of my laser pointer here. 
um, this is a demo on the workload tuning, right? So what we'll see here is um, uh, on the top right, I have a virtual machine, okay? Down here, um, I have a host CPU, right? So this is the host CPUs being consumed. And then I have a performance monitor counter on the host, right? Now what you'll see is on my host, I have two, uh, I, I have two processors, 10 cores each, right? I'm not hyper-threading. So I could have up to 20 different bars here. Each different bar would represent a different CPU core, okay? So that's where the packets are coming in on the different CPU cores. And I'm just using n triple TCP to receive traffic into this virtual machine. Remember VMQ and dynamic VMQ, all this stuff is a receive side offload. Right? Um, I'm gonna speed this up just a little bit because yeah, let me back up here. All right, so as you see traffic come in, you'll see bang, right? All three VMQs hit right away, right? The traffic is hitting all three of them. And um, I'm actually hitting like CPU 19. You can see I'm moving them around already. Give it a second. I have 10 gigabits coming into the system. So that's more than what a single VMQ can do. This is uh, CPU two. Next up is, and you can see it in task manager, right? It's being consumed. It's not as high as the other ones. CPU three here, CPU three is almost pegged. And then CPU 19 at the bottom, right? That's also pegged. So, now what I'm going to do, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a uh, CPU burner. I'm going to pause it for a second there. I have a CPU burner that we have up on GitHub, right, called Start CPU Burn. And I'm going to tell it to peg uh, CPU2, right? So this is a user mode process that's coming in, and it's going to contend with the packet processing, right? And what we're going to see, oh, sorry, CPU3. That's the blue line right here. So. You'll see a, real quick, I'm gonna pause again. You see this sharp decline, I'm not sure if you can see here, but there's a sharp decline, which is that. Uh, this dark shade is actually kernel processing. The sharp decline means that, hey, see, uh, kernel processing is being stopped, right? I can't see, I can't actually use the kernel processing. And you can see I, I lose, I was wrong, it was the yellow line there. I, the yellow line drops and it immediately picks up on the other processor, right? On processor two. And so now you can start to see over here that CPU two, you know, CPU three is dropped, CPU two has picked up the traffic and the virtual machine continues to receive the necessary traffic. This is dynamic VMMQ in action. We have multiple VMQs and we automatically will move them when the workload is contended. All right, next up. Very cool. All right, so now this is the core coalescing, right? This is what we talked about before, uh, where the host for maximum host efficiency, right, while still enabling the workloads to function, will actually coalesce the workload down to as few CPUs as possible. Now, the key to bring up here is, again, I have the same basic setup. I have a virtual machine up here, right? I have a PowerShell host on the uh, PowerShell window here. Now I have two performance monitor counters, right? On the top, I have the same setup we had before, right? Which is each one of these bars represents a different CPU core, okay? And um, you'll see the packets being received on one through the 20 CPU cores that I have here, one of one or more of the 20 CPU cores that I have here. But down here, I actually have the queue assignments, right, per processor. So what that means is a VMQ is assigned, in this case, VMQ10, uh, sorry, not VMQ10, uh, a VMQ is assigned to CPU 10, right? And a VMQ here is assigned to CPU 15. Unfortunately, I couldn't get Performance Monitor to make all of the numbers and make this very clear, but effectively, I, this, this uh, axis right here, zero through 20 are the CPUs on the system, and each bar represents a different VMQ assigned to that CPU, right? And you'll notice that these, C, that these VMQs are already pre-allocated, right? This is what we talked about, queue parking, right? So I'm leaving the, the queues available on the system, right? I'm not using them right now, but I'm putting them out there just in case I need them, right? And so I'm, I may have to speed this one up a little bit too, but um, yeah, I think I'm talking technically in the <laughs> on the real recording here. So I'll just fast forward this. Keep 
going. Yeah, I'm talking, talking, talking. All right, so here I start Entrable TCP again. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm about to start receiving traffic into VM01. Okay. And what you'll see is you'll see these cores, different cores light up to receive all the traffic. And then you'll see the receive queues should coalesce onto one CPU. So as soon as that, you see all the CPUs receiving, and now they've balanced, right? So I only actually need, this is a low throughput system, I only actually need one core, right? In this core in the case, it looks like a CPU 17, right? I only actually need one core to sustain this workload, right? And so all of these VMQs have been reassigned now. We've been coalesced onto one CPU. That's all I need, okay? Um, whereas before, I was parked on multiple different cores, I'm now coalesced down onto, uh, onto a single core. So let me back that up real quick because the, yeah, let me back that up real quick. I think it's about here. When the traffic first starts, you see multiple CPUs based on where these guys are, multiple uh, VMQs are receiving traffic on different CPUs. And then it coalesces down to one, one processor. All right, and now when, as the workload finishes, right, as we kill this processor, it'll actually go back and it'll snap back into place there. So we, we remain queue parked uh, after the workload is done, okay? So those are two scenarios where dynamic VMMQ will actually um, provide better host CPU efficiency, match the necessary bandwidth, right, and bursty workloads, and it'll also make sure that your VMQs um, don't get, are not contended with, right? So your virtual machines receive all the traffic that they're trying to to receive. Were there any questions on on that? I've gone a few, uh, quite a few minutes without any questions, so I'm getting uh, skeptical. Is everybody asleep? No, 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 no. They, I think they are very fascinated, like okay. I am. Um, I have some questions, but if you have, uh, do you have um, more demos, or are we at the end of the presentations and we do the so, questions? So I have about two more slides, and then let's do questions. How about that? Okay. All right. So I want to talk about VMQ myths that are dispelled, right? So first and foremost, I've heard a lot of people say, I disable RSS because I'm using VMQ, right? Now, that might make sense in 2012 and 2012 R2 when these things were completely um, unrelated, right? But when you disable RSS, you're actually disabling every adapter, uh, RSS on every adapter, whether it's attached to a virtual switch or not. And VMQ only works for virtual switches, right? So we no longer support, this is a change again, we no longer support disabling RSS on any version of, any uh, supported version of Windows, right? This is a, this is a base functionality that, uh, RSS is a base capability that uh, most of the other offloads actually depend on. Um, you know, these synthetic offloads that we talked about, they depend on RSS now. So we don't support this on any uh, modern version of Windows, disabling RSS, excuse me. Um, you do not need to overlap your CPUs. In fact, we actually recommend that you don't modify the CPU assignment for VMQ and VMMQ. You should not typically be running set net adapter VMQ or set net adapter RSS. You do not need to do that. Um, by default, in 2012 and 2012 R2, you did need to do that because we did not enable any processors by default um, to be used by the adapters. We only allowed CPU zero by default. But in uh, 2016 and later, all CPUs are available to the NICs, right? And so not only do you not have to modify the the um, you know the process the the adapters to overlap or not overlap or you know whichever scenario you're in, you don't have to worry about that anymore, right? We do the right thing for you out of the box. Um, we all, you also don't need to modify the process array in general, right? Um, if you're, if you have super tight SLAs, right? You could, you, you could pr modify the processor array, right? What I mean by that is if you really need to control the traffic, right? And, the, and you can't afford for any, um, any, uh, contention or on the processors or anything like that you might still want to modify this, right? But in reality, the, the reasons for this are kind of bad ones, right? You should really just be using SRIOV or RDMA into the guest, 
um, that that's really how you're going to you know this is really for where you have to lower your latency and make sure that uh, you know make sure that the uh, NICs are only using the closest uh, processor arrays etc right uh, the closest processors but it's really not necessary today and for most workloads um, if you do end up configuring the processor array we recommend you use the process the the pr uh, profiles there are default profiles built in that you can say you know use the closest NUMA, NUMA nodes, right? Don't, don't span NUMA nodes, um, and, you know, variety of different things there. So we recommend using those profiles. Um, set does enhance VMQ, right? You do not get the same experience with LBFO. I've heard a lot of people say, there's no benefit, no, no difference in how this works between LBFO and set. Well, I'm the, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm the program manager for this stuff. I will tell you, there is a difference. And I, as I just explained, there is a difference with how set works uh, over LBFO with VMQ, right? It enables VMMQ, enables dynamic VMMQ, and in general, it's just more efficient than LBFO because we've been bug fixing it for, you know, since server 2016. Um, these two commandlets, set net adapter RSS and set net adapter VMQ are interchangeable. You do not have to use set net adapter VMQ in one case and set net adapter in another. They actually do the same thing. If your adapters are attached to a vSwitch, they will operate exactly the same. And then finally, if you have a missing indirection table, this is another scenario uh, where you have a, you know, if you're looking at the physical NIC, you will no longer see the indirection tables, right? The mapping of uh, VMQs to processors. Um, that does not mean that RSS is not enabled on that adapter, right? It simply means that TCP IP is no longer bound to that adapter, and that's the only place that you would be receiving traffic, right? The, the traffic, the indirection table will actually be shown on the VNICs uh, in there. So don't, again, don't disable RSS, okay? Um, and that actually is my last slide. Now, there is one question that I did not answer um, from before, which is requirements for set. Can I have, um, you know, can I combine, can I have one gigabit NIC uh, with 10 gigabit NICs? So this is a, I'll give you the two answers. That's a yes and no, right? So on the system where you have, let's say you have two one gigabit NICs and two 10 gigabit NICs, you can create two separate set teams. You could set team the one gigabit NICs and the 10 gigabit NICs. Uh, the reason for that, but you cannot intermingle them, right? And the reason we say that is uh, we require, switch embedded teaming requires symmetric uh, adapters. Now, a symmetric network adapter means adapters of the same make, model, speed, and configuration, right? So make, model, speed, and configuration. So for example, if you have a QLogic uh, 4100 or Marvell 4100 adapter, you need to have another Marvell 4100 adapter to, uh, to team together. If you have an integrated Intel one gigabit NIC, so long as you have multiple integrated Intel one gigabit NICs that are the same type, you can do that, right? But again, it's make and model. So if it's you know, a QLogic 4100 and a QLogic 4500, you should not team those, right? They may use different drivers. Um, you know, a, a case in point might be, I have a Mellanox CX3 and a Mellanox CX4. Well, they use different drivers, right? You should not team them. Um, in general, if it's not the same make, model, speed, or configuration, don't team the adapters. Right? Um, other than that, I think that was the only other question I believe I did not actually answer. Um, oh, there are there are more, but uh, okay. Let's, <laughs> let's yeah. me just do a slide, and then uh, then we go to the other okay. questions. But I can't. Uh, okay. Um, I just want to uh, give an announcement about the next webinar. It will take on the 15th of November. Uh, it's uh, Friday at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, German time, so European uh, summer time. Uh, and I will talk about the S2D news from Ignite. So I'm not sure if I have uh, an hour webinar, but I'm, I'm thinking there will be enough new stuff at Ignite, uh, so we can talk about that. Ignite is in in the week before that webinar. And uh, now we go to the questions, the more questions we had. So and these are maybe some complicated ones. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> let me see. I have to scroll up a bit. Why not 
using an SRIOE-enabled SR, 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 vSwitch. Does it matter whether the SRIOE SR, net adapter advanced property is enabled or disabled? It does not matter that. Uh, so if you are, so part of SRIOV is you need to install the driver into the operating, into the virtual machine, right? Um, so you can check the SRIOV uh, box. However, you'll probably see some event logs and, and warnings that you know say, hey, I couldn't allocate a, a virtual function to this adapter in your guest. Um, so it's probably not ideal. Um, but it it probably it will not be working, I don't believe, unless you install the drivers and you know do all this mm. this setup there. Um, but ultimately, the SRIOV actually bypasses the uh, virtual switch, right? So this is a different data path which we did not talk about today. It's not subject to VMMQ or uh, VMQ or VRSS or any of that. Okay, cool. Then Olaf had a question. I assume that CPUX means L CPU, so logical CPU. I don't think so, Olaf. It's a, a real core. Is NUMA spanning possible? Uh, some, something to think about with these features. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah, so NUMA spanning. I, I briefly touched on this. So let me kind of go back to that, right? So NUMA spanning with um, VMMQ. So, yeah. So on my system, right, I had uh, two different processors, right? Do you do you want to show your screen? Then I have to switch back. No, that's okay. But okay. on my um, on my system, I had two different processors for a total of 20 cores each, right? So I had different NUMAs, right? Do, different NUMA affinity. Um, NUMA affinity, uh, NUMAs, right? The spanning NUMAs really will increase your latency, right? It doesn't necessarily incur much more CPU, if any, um, but it does incur additional latency, right? It has to go further to get to that processor from the adapter's perspective, right? Um, and so if you have really tightly bound SLAs um, where you need to keep latency as low as possible uh, and you can't use SRIOV or RDMA into those guests, then you would want to consider uh, modifying your processor array to stay local to that, uh, to the local NUMA, right? Mm -hmm. To the local processors. but uh, generally speaking, I would say that most people are not in that case. I, I would say it's probably higher than 95% of people in scenarios that I've seen are not in that that case, right? Um, if you are real, if you have that tightly bound um, requirements, you really should be using probably SRIOV, which has much lower latency, right? You're getting you're giving effectively direct access to the hardware through SRIOV or uh, guest RDMA, which again you have direct access to the hardware. Um, okay. Yeah. So another question from Jaromir, one of your PFEs. Uh, um, <laughs> so uh, just email me, Jaromir. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, it's an important one. I have the same one actually. Is it needed to fine tune Numa node assignment in modern Nix? No, it's not. Is anything needed regards removing CPU zero from VMQ processor? Ah, uh, yes. So, so we have good the question. overload of CPU zero. So is there something built in there or you are thinking yeah, about that, it? No, that's a good question. And I did not have this on the slide. So thank you, Yarmir, actually for bringing this up. Um, so in server 2016, right, where we do not have dynamic VMMQ, um, you should absolutely move off of CPU zero, right? So the only modification in my opinion, that you really need to do, or that you should actually, you know, in, in most cases would be a benefit, is to uh, modify your processor array to avoid CPU zero. If you're hyper-threading, then CPU zero and CPU one, right? Um, in my case, I was not, right? I was not hyper-threading, so I would only use uh, block CPU zero. Um, the reason we do this is because so many different things actually land on CPU zero, right? So for example, if you have an RDP session into it, my understanding is RDP will only ever connect to CPU zero, right? Well, if I'm consuming all 100% of CPU zero with network processing, I won't be able to RDP into my box, right? Um, and there's a, there's a variety of different things that only land on CPU zero. And so that's where the intent there is. Um, now, in practice though, if you have dynamic VMMQ, right? Dynamic VMMQ should detect this, uh, this oversubscription on CPU zero and move away from CPU zero, right? So you should never be, um, you know, over 
really over 95% pegged on that core. And you should always be able to use CPU zero at that point. So theoretically, again, you don't have to do the same modification on 2019. What I would recommend is that you test your workloads, right? Because eventually you're gonna come back to this recording and say, hey, Dan said I didn't have to move off the CPU zero on server 2019. And I'll say, well, did you test it? Because I also had this thing, you know, this part of the conversation where I told okay. you to test it, so. <laughs> um, so you, uh, uh, Brian has another question. Uh, so dynamic VM, uh, VMQ should be enabled on all capable VNICs. Uh, did you so understand the question? <laughs> I, I, I think I understand the question. I think the question is, um, do I have to do anything to enable dynamic VMQ Dynamo, dynamic VMMQ for a virtual NIC? And the answer there is no. So there, there's a, uh, again, something else I didn't have my, on my slides there. In server 2016, virtual machine multi-queue, VMMQ, was disabled by default. And the reason we disabled it by default was because in server 2012 R2 and server 2012, um, we had a lot of VMQ issues, right? We were just getting, you know, our customers were plagued by this, uh, offload this somewhat new offload called vmq right um where you know there was driver problems and the operating system working with the driver just there was some problem there and we just had a lot of failures right and so um by default now our general approach is that we will ship a new feature disabled and you can it, uh, you know opportunistically enable it and that's what we did in server 2016. in server 2019 however um this is the second shipping of virtual machine multi-queue and so we have enabled it by default right now if you have a driver an updated driver dynamic vmmq will be also enabled and also possible in which case that will also be enabled by default however the inbox drivers will not uh, do not support dynamic vmmq so the first thing you need to do when you get a server 2019 system is update to the latest and greatest driver and firmware okay mm -hmm. Once you do that and you have Hyper-V installed and you, you know, you should see uh, on your set teams, VMMQ is enabled. And if you run set VM network, or, sorry, excuse me, get VM network adapter and you get the properties for um, a VNIC, whether it's a host VNIC or a, a virtual VM NIC, you can uh, see the scheduling algorithm that's actually used. It's called VRSS uh, Q scheduling algorithm, uh, Q scheduling there's a queue scheduling uh, property there that could either be dynamic, static, uh, sorry, dynamic, static VRSS, or static VMQ. If you don't support dynamic, or if dynamic is not, work, you know, by default, dynamic will be the default. Otherwise, you might get static VRSS, right? If, you're, if you see static VRSS there, you're not using dynamic, so you should either troubleshoot that or, you know, check with your vendor to make sure that you have a, certifi a premium certified adapter. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are already 20 minutes uh, past the time. I will go through the rest of the questions, of course, because people ask them. But I don't don't know. Dan, do you have a, a hard cut here somewhere? Because I, I don't. Uh, I'm actually good. Yeah. Okay, you're good. So uh, I think we need another five minutes or so, or maybe that's ten. Fine, yeah. <laughs> so no, that's fine. when. When using set with RDMA VNIX with DCB, I believe you can't use max bandwidth or max bandwidth weight on virtual machines. Is there a support way to control virtual machine bandwidth when using RDMA plus DCB VNIX on the host? That's so Michael, good... Michael wants to limit, I think, the amount of bandwidth a virtual <clears throat> machine gets. And you are yeah. thinking the other way around. You want to get the maximum. Uh, that's yeah. Possible. So I, I. Why don't we take this one offline? Because I, I don't want to speak out of turn, especially when it's recorded. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I have some initial thoughts on this actually, um, and I'd like to hear more about the scenario. We yeah. do. I, I think we have a solution that will work for you. Um, but I, yeah, I'd, I, let's let's take that one offline. That's a good yeah, question. Michael, Michael sent me uh, the question, c.rachfal at rachfal.de, and I will bring you in contact with Dan. Great. I hope that's okay. So can you compare set features to the competition's competitive solution? VMware, Nutanix, this is Jaromir again. Hi, Jaromir. <laughs> <laughs> so can you compare that, or are you only knowledgeable about the Hyper-V stuff? That's the way out for you. Well, I guess what I, I would argue is, 
what I, what I would ask you is if there's something you want to know about, like, do we have a capability? I mean, I can't go through all the features, right? That we, we don't have yeah. enough time, but if we want to, um, you know, I think is maybe if the question is, do we do compete analysis? Sure. I mean, of course, I'm sure they do as well. So, um, you know, if you have a specific thing that you want to understand, you know, is there a more targeted question you can ask, like about a specific capability? Let, that let you me know? let me burn my hands here. So I would say uh, I think that uh, Hyper-V and the network uh, improvements we have there, and you didn't show the demo with the 35 gigabit from one VM. Yeah, I oh, yeah. think there is not much competition at that level of speed we get in a VM. Yeah, and actually we can go up to about 50 or so, depending on oh, your host so. CPUs. We can actually exceed the 35. Um, yeah, I, the the next that I showed you was, um, uh, or the, the so the the demo that Carson is talking about, uh, I think it was at Ignite last year. Yeah, where I have uh, 40 gigabit NICs, um, and I can actually reach through the synthetic data path, like we just talked about. I think uh, you know we reached about 39 gigabits or so, right? Um, yeah. Now, and that's again that's through synthetic, but yeah. we have larger adapters, right, that we test on, um, and we can get up to uh, about 50 gigabits, you know, so that could be spread across all of your VMs. You know, I, I, again, it's gonna, it's actually higher than 50 gigabits, but again, I say 50 because that's, you know, I don't know what hardware you're on and that type of stuff, right? So if it's, okay. if it's configured properly for VMMQ um, and you're willing to spend the CPU cycles and whatnot, right? I mean, you can get up to about 50 gigabits into either it's a single virtual NIC or multiple virtual NICs, right? I over the synthetic data path. That doesn't actually prevent you from using the rest of the bandwidth on the adapters. Um, like if you have a 100 gig NIC, you could get about 50 gigabits or, or 55 gigabits out of the synthetic data path, and then the rest could be RDMA. That's quite cool. So I have a Jan uh, ask a question. Our Intel NICs are crashing the host with SET, especially with integrated management network. Jan, I, I will burn my fingers here again. Jan, I assume you have the Intel uh, X7 22 and this card is really not a good choice let uh, i think your problems are with the hardware not with the set switch you are not the only customer who has huge problems with these intel NICs. uh what i would you say don't have there to is say anything. Wanna, no, no i'm just <laughs> saying if you if you want to follow up on that um if there are some identified bugs or if you actually if you have a support case um we can follow up with intel actually See if okay. they can troubleshoot some of that as That's well. That's a nice hardware-based issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have been struggling to get VMMQ working on our S2D HCI cluster on server 2016. We are using SET. However, we do have RSS disabled. So, Matt, that's a problem here, maybe. Um, with the knowledge from this presentation, is RSS being turned off likely the case here? Yes. Uh, so okay. if you if you look at GetNet Adapter Advanced Property, right, you'll see very few features called VMQ, right? The ones that are there are typically um, legacy features, right? Um, what you will see though is things like virtual switch RSS and uh, RSS on host vports. You'll see features like that in GetNet Adapter Advanced Property. Um, those are RSS features, and those effectively enable or disable VMMQ. Uh -huh. um, and Matt is using uh, Mellanox Connect X4. <clears throat> These cards are good. Maybe update to the latest firmware and driver. Yeah. yeah now, yeah. So I would say, you know, they have a 2.2 driver out. I think at the time of recording here. You know, 2.3 already. Yeah. Is it 2.3? Okay. So yeah. yes, I would. I would make sure that your drivers are updated. Always, especially whenever you're talking about uh, an offload, and that's kind of why, what the purpose of that NIC offload slide was. Um, you know, this is a NIC offload. It's not all the operating system doing all this work, right? So make sure, make sure, just like you Windows update, make sure that you update uh, your NIC driver and firmware. Yeah. And one more point on that: if you have a uh, OEM branded adapter, okay, they do not update the firmware uh, with the driver. If you have a IHV, like a NIC vendor branded, so in your case you have Mellanox. If it says, if in Get Net adapter it says Mellanox or QLogic or something like that, right? Um, <clears throat> When you install the driver, it will also update the firmware. But if it says like HPE or Dell or Lenovo or something like that for your adapter, that firmware won't, won't be up, updated automatically. So you might have yeah. to do that separately. Make sure you do both. 
that's true. So, and we have an uh, Elma is also um, saying that the Intel network card uh, uh, has problems with drivers, and they all also have seen that with S2D and stuff. <coughs> Thanks, Elma. So now we are really at the end of all the questions. This was great. Uh, it started slow with questions, but we had a lot, <laughs> a lot of them in the end. I said to get to the meat of, you know, VMQ, yes. VRSS, VMQ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, guys, uh, thank you for your time and thank you for letting me uh, come and, and chat here, uh, Karsten. Um, yeah, I, I, just... I have to thank you. I uh, I actually have to con confess, I learned also uh, three or five, four, three or five things here. <laughs> That's <laughs> so great. Then, uh, great. And you have presentations at Ignite, right? You I have, have the... one session at Ignite, but I will be there uh, all week, actually. So yeah, I would so... definitely encourage you to come see Carmen, Carmen Concroli and my uh, presentation. I believe Cosmos will make a special guest appearance as well there. Um, and we're, we have something great cooking for you guys. You guys okay, know. That's, I, will, I will do that in my next webinar, of course, for all the people who can't go to Ignite, but the, usually the Ignite sessions are recorded and we can watch them. So thanks a yeah. lot then. This was a great webinar. I enjoyed it a lot and I think uh, my attendees too. So I will close now. We are at nearly 90 minutes. Thanks, folks, and see you soon, and the recording will be sent out soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.